Downstairs, Meatball Mulligan's lease-breaking party was moving into its 40th hour. On the kitchen floor, amid a litter of empty champagne fifths, were Sandor Rojas and three friends, playing spit in the ocean and staying awake on Hydesec and Benzedrine pills. In the living room, Duke, Vincent, Crinkles, and Paco sat couched over a 15-inch speaker which had been bolted into the top of a waste paper basket, listening to 27 watts worth of the Hero's Gate at Kiev. They all wore horn-rimmed sunglasses and rapt expressions and smoked funny-looking cigarettes which contained not, as you might expect, tobacco, but an adulterated form of cannabis sativa. This group was the Duke DeAngelis Quartet. They recorded for a local label called Tambu and had to their credit one 10-inch LP entitled Songs of Outer Space. From time to time, one of them would flick the ashes from his cigarette into the speaker cone to watch them dance around. Meatball himself was sleeping over by the window, holding an empty magnum to his chest as if it were a teddy bear. Several government girls, who worked for people like the State Department and NSA, had passed out on couches, chairs, and in one case the bathroom sink. This was in early February of 57, and back then there were a lot of American expatriates around Washington, D.C., who would talk, every time they met you, about how someday they were going to go over to Europe for real, but right now it seemed they were working for the government. Everyone saw a fine irony in this. They would stage, for instance, polyglot parties where the newcomer was sort of ignored if he couldn't carry on simultaneous conversations in three or four languages. They would haunt Armenian delicatessens for weeks at a stretch and invite you over for bulgur and lamb in tiny kitchens whose walls were covered with bullfight posters. They would have affairs with sultry girls from Andalusia or the Midi who studied economics at Georgetown. Their dome was a collegiate rathskeller out on Wisconsin Avenue called the Old Heidelberg, and they had to settle for cherry blossoms instead of lime trees when spring came, but in its lethargic way, their life provided, as they said, kicks. At the moment, Meatball's party seemed to be gathering its second wind. Outside there was rain. Rain splattered against the tar paper on the roof and was fractured into a fine spray off the noses, eyebrows, and lips of wooden gargoyles under the eaves, and ran like drool down the window panes. The day before, it had snowed, and the day before that, there had been winds of gale force, and before that, the sun made the city glitter bright as April, though the calendar read early February. It is a curious season in Washington, this false spring. Somewhere in it are Lincoln's birthday and the Chinese New Year, and the forlornness in the streets because cherry blossoms are weeks away, and still, as Sarah Vaughan has put it, spring will be a little late this year. Generally, crowds like the one which would gather in the old Heidelberg on weekday afternoons to drink Wurzburger and to sing Lily Marlene, not to mention the sweetheart of Sigma Chi, are inevitably and incorrigibly romantic. And as every good romantic knows, the soul, spiritus, ruach, pneuma, is nothing, substantially, but air. It is only natural that warpings in the atmosphere should be recapitulated in those who breathe it, so that over and above the public components, holidays, tourist attractions, there are private meanderings linked to the climate as if this spell were a stretto passage in the year's fugue. Haphazard weather, aimless loves, unpredicted commitments. Months one can easily spend in fugue, because oddly enough, later on, winds, rains, passions of February and March are never remembered in that city. It is as if they had never been. The last bass notes of the hero's gate boomed up through the floor and woke Callisto from an uneasy sleep. The first thing he became aware of was a small bird he had been holding gently between his hands against his body. He turned his head sideways on the pillow to smile down at it, at its blue hunched-down head and sick, lidded eyes, wondering how many more nights he would have to give it warmth before it was well again. He had been holding the bird like that for three days. It was the only way he knew to restore its health. Next to him, the girl stirred and whimpered, her arm thrown across her face. Mingled with the sounds of the rain came the first tentative, querulous morning voices of the other birds, hidden in philodendrons and small fan palms, patches of scarlet, yellow and blue laced through this Rousseau-like fantasy, this hothouse jungle it had taken him seven years to weave together. Hermetically sealed, it was a tiny enclave of regularity in the city's chaos. Alien to the vagaries of the weather, of national politics, of any civil disorder. Through trial and error, Callisto had perfected its ecological balance, with the help of the girl, its artistic harmony, so that the swayings of its plant life, the stirrings of its birds and human inhabitants, were all as integral as the rhythms of a perfectly executed mobile. 
He and the girl could no longer, of course, be omitted from that sanctuary. They had become necessary to its unity. What they needed from outside was delivered. They did not go out. Is he all right? She whispered. She lay like a tawny question mark facing him, her eyes suddenly huge and dark and blinking slowly. Callisto ran a finger beneath the feathers at the base of the bird's neck, caressed it gently. He's going to be well, I think. See, he hears his friends beginning to wake up. The girl had heard the rain and the birds even before she was fully awake. Her name was Aubade. She was part French and part Annamese. She lived on her own curious and lonely planet, where the clouds and the odor of poinciannas, the bitterness of wine and the accidental fingers at the small of her back or feathery against her breasts came to her reduced inevitably to the terms of sound, of music which emerged at intervals from a howling darkness of discordancy. Obeyed, he said, go see. Obedient, she arose, padded to the window, pulled aside the drapes, and after a moment said, it is 37, still 37. Callisto frowned. Since Tuesday, then, he said, no change. Henry Adams, three generations before his own, had stared aghast at power. Callisto found himself now in much the same state over thermodynamics. The inner life of that power, realizing like his predecessor that the Virgin and the Dynamo stand as much for love as for power, that the two are indeed identical, and that love, therefore, not only makes the world go around, but also makes the bocce ball spin, the nebula precess. It was this latter or side real element which disturbed him. The cosmologists had predicted an eventual heat death for the universe, something like limbo, form and motion abolished, heat energy identical at every point in it. The meteorologists, day to day, staved it off by contradicting with a reassuring array of varied temperatures. But for three days now, despite the changeful weather, the mercury had stayed at 37 degrees Fahrenheit. Leery at omens of apocalypse, Callisto shifted beneath the covers. His fingers pressed the bird more firmly, as if needing some pulsing or suffering assurance of an early break in the temperature. It was that last cymbal crash that did it. Meatball was hurled wincing into consciousness as the synchronized wagging of heads over the waste basket stopped. The final hiss remained for an instant in the room, then melted into the whisper of rain outside. Arr announced Meatball in the silence, looking at the empty magnum. Crinkles, in slow motion, turned, smiled and held out a cigarette. Tea time, man, he said. No, no, said Meatball. How many times I gotta tell you guys, not at my place. You ought to know, Washington is lousy with feds. Crinkles looked wistful. Geez, Meatball, he said. You don't want to do nothing no more. Hair of dog, said Meatball. Only hope. Any juice left? He began to crawl toward the kitchen. No champagne, I don't think, Duke said. Case of tequila behind the icebox. They put on an Earl Bostick side. Meatball paused at the kitchen door, glowering at Sandor Rojas. Lemons, he said after some thought. He crawled to the refrigerator and got out three lemons and some ice cubes, found the tequila and set about restoring order to his nervous system. He drew blood once cutting the lemons and had to use two hands squeezing them and his foot to crack the ice tray, but after about ten minutes, he found himself, through some miracle, beaming down into a monster tequila sour. That looks yummy, Sandro Rojas said. How about you make me one? Meatball blinked at him. Kitchi lofa sashigith, he replied automatically, and wandered away into the bathroom. I say, he called out a moment later to no one in particular, I say, there seems to be a girl or something sleeping in the sink. He took her by the shoulders and shook. Wah, she said. You don't look too comfortable, Meatball said. Well, she agreed. She stumbled to the shower, turned on the cold water, and sat down cross-legged in the spray. That's better, she smiled. Meatball, Sandor Rojas yelled from the kitchen. Somebody is trying to come in the window. A burglar, I think. A second-story man. What are you worrying about, Meatball said. We're on the third floor. He loped back into the kitchen. A shaggy, woebegone figure stood out on the fire escape, raking his fingernails down the window pane. Meatball opened the window. Saul, he said. Sort of wet out, Saul said. He climbed in, dripping. You heard, I guess? Miriam left you, Meatball said. Or something, is all I heard. There was a sudden flurry of knocking at the front door. Do come in, Sandor Rojas called. The door opened, and there were three co-eds from George Washington, all of whom were majoring in philosophy. They were each holding a gallon of Chianti. Sandor leaped up and dashed into the living room. 
We heard there was a party, one blonde said. Young blood, Sandor shouted. He was an ex-Hungarian freedom fighter who had easily the worst chronic case of what certain critics of the middle class have called Don Giovannism in the District of Columbia. Percha porti la gonella, voice pet calce fa. Like Pavlov's dog, a contralto voice or a whiff of arpege, and Sandor would begin to salivate. Meatball regarded the trio blearily as they filed into the kitchen. He shrugged. Put the wine in the ice box, he said, and good morning. Obade's neck made a golden bow as she bent over the sheets of foolscap, scribbling away in the green murk of the room. As a young man at Princeton, Callisto was dictating, nestling the bird against the gray hairs of his chest. Callisto had learned a mnemonic device for remembering the laws of thermodynamics. You can't win. Things are going to get worse before they get better. Who says they're going to get better? At the age of 54, confronted with Gibbs' notion of the universe, he suddenly realized that undergraduate Kant had been oracle, after all. That spindly maze of equations became, for him, a vision of ultimate cosmic heat death. He had known all along, of course, that nothing but a theoretical engine or system ever runs at 100% efficiency. And about the theorem of Clausius, which states that the entropy of an isolated system always continually increases. It was not, however, until Gibbs and Boltzmann brought to this principle the methods of statistical mechanics that the horrible significance of it all dawned on him. Only then did he realize that the isolated system, galaxy, engine, human being, culture, whatever, must evolve spontaneously toward the condition of the more probable. He was forced, therefore, in the sad, dying fall of middle age, to a radical re-evaluation of everything he had learned up to then. All the cities and seasons and casual passions of his days had now to be looked at in a new and elusive light. He did not know if he was equal to the task. He was aware of the dangers of the reductive fallacy and, he hoped, strong enough not to drift into the graceful decadence of the enervated fatalism. His had always been a vigorous, Italian sort of pessimism. Like Machiavelli, he allowed the forces of virtu and fortuna to be about 50-50. But the equations now introduced a random factor which pushed the odds to some unutterable and indeterminate ratio which he found himself afraid to calculate. Around him loomed vague hothouse shapes. The pitifully small heart fluttered against his own. Counterpointed against his words, the girl heard the chatter of birds and fitful car honkings scattered along the wet morning and Earl Bostick's alto rising in occasional wild peaks through the door. The architectonic purity of her world was constantly threatened by such hints of anarchy. Gaps and excrescences and skew lines and a shifting or tilting of planes to which she had continually to readjust lest the whole structure shiver into a disarray of discrete and meaningless signals. Callisto had described the process once as a kind of feedback. She crawled into dreams each night with a sense of exhaustion and a desperate resolve never to relax that vigilance. Even in the brief periods when Callisto made love to her, soaring above the bowing of taut nerves in haphazard double stops would be the one singing string of her determination. Nevertheless, continued Callisto, he found in entropy or the measure of disorganization for a closed system an adequate metaphor to apply to certain phenomena in his own world. He saw, for example, the younger generation responding to Madison Avenue with the same spleen his own had once reserved for Wall Street, and in American consumerism discovered a similar tendency from the least to the most probable, from differentiation to sameness, from ordered individuality to a kind of chaos. He found himself, in short, restating Gibbs' prediction in social terms, and envisioned a heat death for his culture in which ideas like heat energy would no longer be transferred, since each point in it would ultimately have the same quantity of energy, and intellectual motion would, accordingly, cease. He glanced up suddenly. Check it now, he said. Again she rose and peered out at the thermometer. Thirty-seven, she said. The rain has stopped. He bent his head quickly and held his lips against a quivering wing. Then it will change soon, he said, trying to keep his voice firm. Sitting on the stove, Saul was like any big rag doll that a kid had been taking out some incomprehensible rage on. What happened, Meatball said. If you feel like talking, I mean. Of course I feel like talking, Saul said. One thing I did, I slugged her. Discipline must be maintained. Ha, ha. I wish you'd been there. Oh, Meatball, it was a lovely fight. She ended up throwing a handbook of chemistry and physics at me. Only it missed and went through the window, and when the glass broke, I reckoned something in her broke too. 
She stormed out of the house crying, out in the rain, no raincoat or anything. She'll be back. No. Well, soon Meatball said. It was something earth-shattering, no doubt. Like who is better, Sal Mineo or Ricky Nelson? What it was about, Saul said, was communication theory, which of course makes it very hilarious. I don't know anything about communication theory. Neither does my wife. Come right down to it, who does? That's the joke. When Meatball saw the kind of smile Saul had on his face, he said, Maybe you would like tequila or something. No, I mean, I'm sorry. It's a field you can go off the deep end in, is all. You get where you're watching all the time for security cops, behind bushes, around corners. Muffet is top secret. What? Multi-unit factorial field electronic tabulator. You were fighting about that? Miriam has been reading science fiction again. That and Scientific American. It seems she is, as we say, bugged at this idea of computers acting like people. I made the mistake of saying you can just as well turn that around and talk about human behavior like a program fed into an IBM machine. Why not, Meepal said. Indeed, why not? In fact, it is sort of crucial to communication, not to mention information theory. Only when I said that, she hit the roof. Up went the balloon, and I can't figure out why. If anybody should know why, I should. I refuse to believe the government is wasting taxpayers' money on me when it has so many bigger and better things to waste it on. Meatball made a moo. Maybe she thought you were acting like a cold, dehumanized, amoral scientist type. My God, Saul flung up an arm. Dehumanized. How much more human can I get? I worry, Meatball. I do. There are Europeans wandering around North Africa these days with their tongues torn out of their heads because those tongues have spoken the wrong words. Only the Europeans thought they were the right words. Language barrier, Meatball suggested. Sal jumped down off the stove. That, he said, angry, is a good candidate for sick joke of the year. No, Ace, it is not a barrier. If it is anything, it's a kind of leakage. Tell a girl, I love you. No trouble with two-thirds of that. It's a closed circuit. Just you and she. But that nasty four-letter word in the middle, that's the one you have to look out for. Ambiguity. Redundance. Irrelevance, even. Leakage. All this is noise. Noise screws up your signal, makes for disorganization in the circuit. Meatball shuffled around. Well, now, Saul, he muttered. You're sort of, I don't know, expecting a lot from people. I mean, you know. What it is is, most of the things we say, I guess, are mostly noise. Ha, half of what you just said, for example. Well, you do it too. I know, Saul smiled grimly. It's a bitch, ain't it? I bet that's what keeps divorce lawyers in business. Whoops. Oh, I'm not sensitive. Besides, frowning, you're right. You find I think that most successful marriages, Miriam and me, up to last night, are sort of founded on compromises. You never run at top efficiency. Usually, all you have is a minimum basis for a workable thing. I believe the phrase is togetherness. Arr. Exactly. You find that one a bit noisy, don't you? But the noise content is different for each of us because you're a bachelor and I'm not. Or wasn't. The hell with it. Well, sure, Meatball said, trying to be helpful. You were using different words. By human being, you meant something that you can look at like it was a computer. It helps you think better on the job or something. But Miriam meant something entirely. The hell with it. Meatball fell silent. I'll take that drink, Saul said after a while. The card game had been abandoned, and Sandor's friends were slowly getting wasted on tequila. On the living room couch, one of the co-eds and Crinkles were engaged in amorous conversation. No, Crinkles was saying. No, I can't put Dave down. In fact, I give Dave a lot of credit, man, especially considering his accident and all. The girl's smile faded. How terrible, she said. What accident? Hadn't you heard? Crinkles said. When Dave was in the army, just a private E2, they sent him down to Oak Ridge on special duty. Something to do with the Manhattan Project. He was handling hot stuff one day and got an overdose of radiation. So now he's got to wear lead gloves all the time. She shook her head sympathetically. What an awful break for a piano player. Meatball had abandoned Saul to a bottle of tequila and was about to go to sleep in a closet when the front door flew open and the place was invaded by five enlisted personnel of the U.S. Navy, all in varying stages of abomination. This is the place, shouted a fat, pimply seaman apprentice who had lost his white hat. This here is the whorehouse that Chief was telling us about. The stringy-looking third-class boatswain's mate pushed him aside and cased the living room. 
You're right, slab, he said, but it don't look like much, even for stateside. I seen better tail in Naples, Italy. How much, hey? Boomed a large seaman with adenoids, who was holding a mason jar full of white lightning. Oh, my God, said Meatball. Outside, the temperature remained constant at 37 degrees Fahrenheit. In the hothouse, Obeyed stood absently caressing the branches of a young mimosa, hearing a motif of sap rising, the rough and unresolved anticipatory theme of those fragile pink blossoms which, it is said, ensure fertility. That music rose in a tangled tracery, arabesques of order competing fugally with the improvised discords of the party downstairs, which peaked sometimes in cusps and OGs of noise. That precious signal-to-noise ratio, whose delicate balance required every calorie of her strength, seesawed inside the small tenuous skull as she watched Callisto, sheltering the bird. Callisto was trying to confront any idea of the heat death now, as he nuzzled the feathery lump in his hands. He sought correspondences. Sade, of course, and Temple Drake, gaunt and hopeless in her little park in Paris, at the end of Sanctuary, Final Equilibrium, Nightwood, and the tango, any tango, but more than any, perhaps, the sad, sick dance in Stravinsky's L'Histoire de Soldat. He thought back, what had tango music been for them after the war? What meanings had he missed in all the stately coupled automatons in the Café d'Alsance, or in the metronomes which had ticked behind the eyes of his own partners? Not even the clean, constant winds of Switzerland could cure the grip espagnol. Stravinsky had had it. They all had had it. And how many musicians were left after Passchendaele, after the Marne? It came down in this case to seven. Violin, double bass, clarinet, bassoon, cornet, trombone, timpani. Almost as if any tiny troop of Salton Banks had set about conveying the same information as a full pit orchestra. There was hardly a full complement left in Europe. Yet with violin and timpani, Stravinsky had managed to communicate in that tango the same exhaustion, the same airlessness one saw in the slicked-down youths who were trying to imitate Vernon Castle, and in their mistresses, who simply did not care. Ma maîtresse, Celeste, returning to Nice after the Second War, he had found that café replaced by a perfume shop, which catered to American tourists, and no secret vestige of her in the cobblestones or in the old pension next door. No perfume to match her breath, heavy with the sweet Spanish wine she always drank. And so instead, he had purchased a Henry Miller novel and left for Paris, and read the book on the train, so that when he arrived, he had been given at least a little forewarning, and saw that Celeste and the others, and even Temple Drake, were not all that had changed. Obeyed, he said. My head aches. The sound of his voice generated in the girl an answering scrap of melody. Her movement toward the kitchen, the towel, the cold water, and his eyes following her formed a weird and intricate canon. As she placed the compress on his forehead, his sigh of gratitude seemed to signal a new subject, another series of modulations. No, Meepo was still saying. No, I'm afraid not. This is not a house of ill repute. I'm sorry. Really, I am. Slab was adamant. But the chief said, he kept repeating, the seaman offered to swap the moonshine for a good piece. Meepo looked around frantically, as if seeking assistance. In the middle of the room, the Duke D'Angelis Quartet were engaged in a historic moment. Vincent was seated and the others standing. They were going through the motions of a group having a session, only without instruments. I say, Meatball said. Duke moved his head a few times, smiled faintly, lit a cigarette, and eventually caught sight of Meatball. Quiet, man, he whispered. Vincent began to fling his arms around, his fists clenched, then, abruptly, was still, then repeated the performance. This went on for a few minutes while Meatball sipped his drink moodily. The Navy had withdrawn to the kitchen. Finally, at some invisible signal, the group stopped tapping their feet, and Duke grinned and said, At least we ended together. Meatball glared at him. I say, he said. I have this new conception, man, Duke said. You remember your namesake? You remember Jerry? No, said Meatball. I'll remember April, if that's any help. As a matter of fact, Duke said, it was love for sale, which shows how much you know. The point is, it was Mulligan, Chet Baker and that crew, way back then, out yonder. You dig? Baritone sax, Meatball said. Something about a baritone sax. But no piano, man. No guitar or accordion. You know what that means? Not exactly, Meatball said. Well, first let me just say, 
that I am no Mingus, no John Lewis. Theory was never my strong point. I mean things like reading were always difficult for me at all. I know, Meatball said dryly. You got your card taken away because you changed key on happy birthday at a Kiwanis Club picnic. Rotarian, but it occurred to me, in one of these flashes of insight, that if that first quartet of mulligans had no piano, it could only mean one thing. No chords, said Paco, the baby-faced bass. What he is trying to say, Duke said, is no root chords. Nothing to listen to while you blow a horizontal line. What one does in such a case is, one thinks the roots. A horrified awareness was dawning on Meatball. And the next logical extension, he said, is to think everything, Duke announced with simple dignity. Roots, line, everything. Meatball looked at Duke, awed. But, he said, well, Duke said honestly, there are a few bugs to work out. But, Meatball said, just listen, Duke said, you'll catch on. And off they went again into orbit, presumably somewhere around the asteroid belt. After a while, Crinkles made an embouchure and started moving his fingers, and Duke clapped his hand to his forehead. Oaf, he roared. The new head we're using, you remember. I wrote last night. Sure, Crinkles said. The new head. I come in on the bridge. All your heads, I come in then. Right, Duke said. So why? Wah, said Crinkles. Sixteen bars. I wait. I come in. Sixteen? Duke said. No, no, Crinkles. Eight you waited. You want me to sing it? A cigarette that bears a lipstick's traces. An airline ticket to romantic places. Crinkles scratched his head. These foolish things, you mean. Yes, Duke said. Yes, Crinkles, bravo. Not I'll remember April, Crinkles said. Mingi Mort, said Duke. I figured we were playing it a little slow, Crinkles said. Meatball chuckled. Back to the old drawing board, he said. No, man, Duke said. Back to the airless void. And they took off again, only it seemed Paco was playing in G-sharp while the rest were in E-flat, so they had to start all over. In the kitchen, two of the girls from George Washington and the sailors were singing, Let's all go down and piss on the forest stall. There was a two-handed, bilingual mora game on over by the icebox. Saul had filled several paper bags with water and was sitting on the fire escape, dropping them on passers-by in the street. A fat government girl in a Bennington sweatshirt recently engaged to an ensign attached to the forestall, came charging into the kitchen, head lowered, and butted Slab in the stomach. Figuring this was as good an excuse for a fight as any, Slab's buddies piled in. The Mora players were nose-to-nose, -nose, screaming twa, set, at the tops of their lungs. From the shower the girl Meatball had taken out of the sink announced that she was drowning. She had apparently sat on the drain and the water was now up to her neck. The noise in Meatball's apartment had reached a sustained, ungodly crescendo. Meatball stood and watched, scratching his stomach lazily. The way he figured, there were only about two ways he could cope. A. Lock himself in the closet and maybe eventually they would all go away. Or B. Try to calm everybody down, one by one. A was certainly the more attractive alternative. But then he started thinking about that closet. It was dark and stuffy and he would be alone. He did not feature being alone. And then this crew off the good ship Lollipop or whatever it was might take it upon themselves to kick down the closet door for a lark. And if that happened, he would be, at the very least, embarrassed. The other way was more a pain in the neck, but probably better in the long run. So he decided to try and keep his lease-breaking party from deteriorating into total chaos. He gave wine to the sailors and separated the Mora players. He introduced the fat government girl to Sandor Rojas, who would keep her out of trouble. He helped the girl in the shower to dry off and get into bed. He had another talk with Saul. He called a repairman for the refrigerator, which someone had discovered was on the blink. This is what he did until nightfall, when most of the revelers had passed out and the party trembled on the threshold of its third day. Upstairs Callisto, helpless in the past, did not feel the faint rhythm inside the bird begin to slacken and fail. Obeyed was by the window, wandering the ashes of her own lovely world. The temperature held steady. The sky had become a uniform darkening gray. Then something from downstairs, a girl's scream, an overturned chair, a glass dropped on the floor. He would never know what exactly, pierced that private time warp, and he became aware of the faltering, the constriction of muscles, the tiny tossings of the bird's head, and his own pulse began to pound more fiercely, as if trying to compensate. Obeyed, he called weakly. He's dying. The girl, flowing and wrapped, crossed the hothouse to gaze down at Callisto's hands. 
The two remained like that, poised for one minute and two, while the heartbeat ticked a graceful diminuendo, down at last into stillness. Callisto raised his head slowly. I held him, he protested, impotent with the wonder of it, to give him the warmth of my body, almost as if I were communicating life to him, or a sense of life. What has happened? Has the transfer of heat ceased to work? Is there no more? He did not finish. I was just at the window, she said. He sank back, terrified. She stood a moment more, irresolute. She had sensed his obsession long ago, realized somehow that that constant 37 was now decisive. Suddenly then, as if seeing the single and unavoidable conclusion to all this, she moved swiftly to the window before Callisto could speak, tore away the drapes and smashed out the glass with two exquisite hands, which came away bleeding and glistening with splinters, and turned to face the man on the bed and wait with him until the moment of equilibrium was reached, when 37 degrees Fahrenheit should prevail both outside and inside, and forever, and the hovering, curious dominant of their separate lives should resolve into a tonic of darkness and the final absence of all motion.